Hello, everybody. Welcome again. There's some echo on the sound. Yeah, thanks. Um, hello, good morning. Uh, respect to those in Vancouver. Good morning, New York and uh, Santiago Amil. Um, good afternoon, Europe, MENA, Africa, and uh, good evening, Australia, Oceania. Here we are, day three of the Atelier for Solidarity, I'm, uh, organized by the Festival Academy, which is an initiative of the European Festivals Association. We started again early this morning and we're going on until late tonight. I'm kind of uh, losing track of time. There was Hank who referred yesterday to um, where the stupidity, the, the ideas that come out of your stupidity and he said this beautiful sentence of, the irrational idea of what you are capable of. I'm starting to get um, this feeling while being in the seven day atelier that we have right, set up. Um, we are together here with some 80 artists, festival managers, curators, as well as cross-sectoral uh, organizations, social movements, foundations to reimagine the world um, mm -hmm. together. We have seven keynotes and two public panels during um, the seven days. And I'm very delighted to announce the next one, which is Orwan Irabia, who is the international, uh, the artistic director of the International Documentary Festival in Amsterdam, who has set up at the time the first international documentary festival in Syria, Docsbox. There is too much to say about him. So we'll put his bio in the chat for those who are interested. I'm delighted to have you here. And uh, one new item is also that he agreed today to join uh, the board of the Festival Academy, which we are really delighted by. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I give the floor to you. The topic is, uh, which is also very inspiring, I think, the search for the meaning of holding a festival and then again during a pandemic. So Mike, I give the floor to you and to Orwa, Mike van Graan, South African playwright, will facilitate this conversation. And as usual, I don't have very much to do at this point, simply to hand over to Orwa. Looking forward to your stimulating us and provoking us around your talk, the search for meaning, holding a festival, and then again, during a pandemic. Um, Orwa, over to you. Um, hello, everybody. And... Uh... It's truly great pleasure to uh, see all of you in these uh, small, small windows. Um, it is uh, a very, very special um, title, Solidarity, I think. And this is a time when this becomes uh, key, when this is really the subject, the topic. Um, so I am honored to join you and I certainly do not um, do not assume or do not think that I might have so much to uh, add to your experiences other than uh, telling you about mine, because uh, that I think is the best, most meaningful form of exchange. And I, I can say, of course, first that I will speak mostly about film, film festivals, that's where I come from, that's what I do. And I will leave it to each one of you to see the parallels, to see the, uh, uh, to find a meaning to my uh, stories within whatever field it is that you work. So I come from Syria and I grew up in a country that was absolutely ruled by a dictatorship. I grew up to a family stigmatized by being in opposition. Um, I had a very uh, uh, inspired childhood, uh, thinking mostly uh, uh, falling between different mythology masterpieces. I spent my childhood inside uh, around the walls of Troy, as much as with Shehrazad, as much as with Ulysses on the ship going back or not making it back. And that was my childhood response to uh, the life of my family where, where it was a lot of political imprisonment. I spent my childhood with my father in prison. And maybe none of you have a similar experience, but 
in many of the countries I know some of you, you come from, there were similar experiences and there might be now similar experiences. And fortunately, in some countries, there might in the future be similar experiences. And here I am referring and raising solidarity with our friends in Brazil, among other places. So um, what, what I can say is that I just started from wanting to become a director of film. Then uh, we didn't have the money to go study abroad. Uh, I stayed and then I studied to be an actor because that was the closest thing available. But we had a very good uh, institute of drama in Damascus, Syria, where I studied, started a career as an actor. And then I absolutely couldn't bear that. I switched to documentary film. And since 2003, I think, I have been dedicated fully to documentary film in various ways of being dedicated to that. I produced films, I uh, started a small company in a, a very special moment of my country's, my home country's uh, history in the beginning of the millennia. And then uh, I, uh, me and my partner, Diana, Diana, who is also a filmmaker, we, we went actually first to the greatest festival ever be, that's Cannes. After I played a role in a big film as an actor, and we were walking the red carpet and surrounded, we were 23, 22, and surrounded by those hundreds of cameras. And on the top of the stair, we said, fuck, we will never want to be back here again. Then it just happened by coincidence that we visited ITFA, the festival that I'm now director of, uh, a couple of months later. And there I saw on a bar uh, Fred Wiseman, who is one of the greatest legends of documentary film cinema, uh, filmmaking in the world. So I went to Wiseman and I said, hi, my name is Orwan Arabia. I'm a filmmaker producer from Syria. And he said, yeah, sit down, let's have a beer. And the mere fact that I went to one festival where I saw an icon, a great filmmaker I read about and I watched his films before. And he said, sit down, let's have a beer. Compared to another festival where I was only intimidated or felt uh, uncomfortable because of the uh, style, the approach, the appearances. I spent a whole week being ordered to change from casual to smoking, from smoking to tuxedo, from tuxedo back to smoking, and then back to casual. And that was, in a way, a first moment where I thought about what is a festival? What kind of festival is it that I'm interested in being in? What is the meaning of doing all of this? Time, age, experience taught me that actually both have a very, very valid meaning to them. That even the one I hate to be in is not invalid. It is also valid and it adds value at some level. Just not the level I would like to spend my life within. After going to ITFA, we went back home. And I remember very well how Diana said, I'm jealous. I said, of what? She said, of this festival we were just at in Amsterdam. We don't have anything like this in our country. Within a couple of months, we came up with the concept to start a festival in our country. And it was basically motivated by jealousy, by the need for justice, for equality, by the need that we want something like that in ours. It was a very difficult challenge, that's for sure. But at the same time, it was maybe the most meaningful moment of our lives when we decided to do this. So we started with a festival that played, I think, 28 films 
in one cinema in the capital and had a budget, if I'm not wrong now, of $40,000 and brought something like 15 guests. But we had 28,000 tickets, 28,000 admissions. And that was a revelation. That was a moment when we realized that this very small thing we did is actually not that small. And when we did that, we went through a lot of challenge experiences and discoveries. When we did that, we first realized that what we did, the way we wanted to show documentary film and documentary film is one of those arts who bring together politics with society, with activism, with art to the same table. We discovered that whether we do the festival and or not and how we do it is something that is deeply meaningful to the dictator, not only to us. When we do a festival that brings international guests and gets coverage in the press internationally, this gives a good face to a regime that is actually criminal. So it became a question, how do we do what we believe we should be doing without being in service of something we absolutely disagree with. And then also, how do we do what we believe we should be doing and continue to do it? Because when we are radically announcing or taking an opposition stand, the festival will just stop. They will just not allow us to do it. And there started a lifelong examination of how you can balance pragmatism with radicalism. That's where it became a daily question. How do you do what you believe in? How do you take position, take a stand, and at the same time, manage to stay alive and to maintain the actual activities in a pragmatic manner? Because sometimes one can say, the easiest solution is to be a martyr. I'll jump now to a bit of overview and say that film festivals being some of the obviously big parts of festivals at large, started with one, and that is now the Venice Film Festival. The festival in Venice that will take place beginning of September now was initiated or was the very first film festival to be created. And it started just at the beginning of the rise of fascism in Italy. So just before World War II, end of 30s. And at that moment, with the rise of Mussolini, quickly the first competition in the history of film festivals ever was there. And it was, interestingly, it was an award for the most funny film and award for the most fast film. And then the awards were named the Golden Mussolini for the most fast film and the Golden Mussolini for the most funny film. Right at the end of World War II, the festival of Cannes was created to bring in an allied festival against what used to be a fascist Italian festival. And the first thing that happened was that Cannes took the actual dates of the Venice that was. So Cannes became in the best moment of the best uh, uh, weather in the region. And Venice was forced when it came back to change its, its dates because it is also the festival of the losing nation. A while later, way later in the 60s, it was already that Germany was two sides, two Germanys. The side on the right of the map, East Germany, started what is now Doc Leipzig the first documentary film festival we know of in the world. And Doc Leipzig was the position of the communist Germany towards the world. 
a festival that offered great platform that ha was influential in what we now call the third world, or many try to find different ways to describe uh, that world. In Doc Leipzig, the uh, Democratic Republic of Germany used to run all of the documentary films made by the African liberation movements. It was there that films from leftist groups in Latin America were screened. It was there that all of the Palestinian history of documentary film was screened. To counter that, there was an idea in the mind of an employee without a clear position of the US embassy in Berlin, in West Berlin now. And he decided, of course, everybody refers to him as the CIA guy, but it's not sure. It's not, of course, uh, uh, 100. We cannot confirm nor deny. So the CIA guy in the embassy of the USA in Berlin decided that to balance what the East Germans are doing, we have to start a fancy festival here and bring stars and bring big films. And that was actually the beginning of the Berlin International Film Festival. Now, ironically, the first director that this CIA guy hired was just recently, last year, scandalized as being uh, an actual Nazi who was uh, still operating around. Now, what does this see? To me, this says that festivals are political. There's no escaping that. Now, how do we define political? That's another story. What is political? That's our question for each one of us to think about, to decide upon, to start from or to end with. But the fact that it is a political act to organize a festival is something that I believe is not out for debate. It is the starting reality of what we do. Political does not necessarily connect directly with politics. It is a political act. Now, we started a festival in a country where there was censorship. We decided, for example, not to bring to the censor's table for approval all the films we would love to show, but we know have been banned before or will be certainly banned today, because then we will be antagonizing the authorities and we will be uh, giving them a chance or uh, a, an opening to stop us. So we used, we came up with this approach that we called at the time parallel realities. And it was before new media was so common, so it was not meaning many different things. Uh, and in our parallel realities, we started showing films from Poland about the communist regime there, films that tackled the situation in Burma, in Myanmar, in uh, different parts of the world where people would watch a film that is speaking a reality that is so similar to ours, yet the censor will not feel the threat, the censor will allow us to run the film, but then the people leaving the cinema will not be speaking about Poland or Myanmar per se, they will probably be reflecting on their own lives. At that first moment, we started only with one award in the festival, which is a populist approach that we gave only the audience award. But this meant that in Syria 2008, we had a ballot box in front of the cinema and people were putting their ballots inside the box. And that made Reuters at the time write a report with the, with the headline, the first democratic voting in Syria in 40 years. And that was certainly meaningful to us. Then it becomes a question of, is this why we're doing this? What kind of films do we want to show? If we want to keep on winning these points with the press or with the audience or against dictatorship or with like avoiding censorship, we would probably be able to continue. 
However, we continue, but we also betray the original reason we're doing this, which was also because we believed in this art. We believed that making, tackling reality through the language of cinema was not about making art utilitarian. And to me personally, this is a key point. The documentary film smashes in my face, but it applies to a lot of different forms of art and art activism or arts operation in the world. And that again, no right or wrong. I do not believe there is one better way than the other, but I believe that I am clear with myself. I believe that using, making use of art as a utility to prove a point, to campaign, to uh, 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 make statements, to change minds for the elections next morning is an absolute absurdist approach that art has a much slower, much deeper, more profound way of changing who we are as individuals, as societies, than being a direct impactful act of seeking change. That said, then comes money. So what I just said now makes a festival lose more than half of the financing available in the world. Because more than half of the financing available in the world today would be interested in financing social change, social impact, changing people's mind, promoting whatever is fashionable today in terms of change. And this is the reality of financing and where money comes from and how money given to art and culture internationally is being rationalized or justified. And here comes the pragmatism. Can I ever say that an art, in the example of what I do, documentary film, is not about social change? Of course it is about social change. But what does it mean that it is about social change? Does this mean that it will change the vote results next November, for example? Well, if it does, this is probably going to be art that will live only six months and art that will die next year and will have no value whatsoever in 10 years time. All of this continues. This is never stopping. This is a continuous discussion of the meaning. Meaning comes in various ways. Meaning is something that you realize through the shit of organizing festivals or events that is so tiresome and so uh, stressful. And then moments come and make you again re discover, rediscover why this is worth it. I remember standing in front of a full cinema in Damascus, 450 seats, attending for the third part, Patricio Guzman's Battle of Chile, a masterpiece of documentary cinema that comes from Chile, that is black and white from the 70s, extremely classical, that we thought we would show in Damascus translate into Arabic and show for our audience because this is our cultural role. Because nobody will want to watch this. It's black and white, extremely old, irrelevant in any direct sense to what people would like to buy a ticket to watch. But then we were surprised that this filled a 450 seater for three parts of it, for three nights, followed by a 45 minute discussion with the filmmaker after each part. Now, this was a big slap in the face, a wake up call. I really believed it was fine to get 20 people into that cinema because we have this cultural role. But it had 453 times. What I thought was interesting for the audience was absolutely different from what I from what I saw in reality. To me, that again reminded me of the meaning. Next year, we had 
great American master filmmaker, uh, D.A. Pennebaker, come to Damascus, which was, again, a great thing. It was great to go and pitch to the U.S. Embassy in Damascus at the worst times when my own political position was absolutely against anything to do with the U.S. Embassy. But still, go and pitch, bringing Penny Baker from New York to Syria and get them to pay for it for that, and they did. And he came, and it was an unforgettable part of my life, moment of my life, having talks with him in front of the audience, seeing what it means to have such a great filmmaker meet the audience and speak to them. I remember asking him once, so what's your advice for those who want to make films, documentary films, you've been doing this for decades and decades, and there is absolutely, obviously, not so much money in it, not so much fame in it. It's really a kind of a seclusion, this art. And he said, it is like you are driving around the world in a broken car. You don't have money to fix it. You don't have anything to do to make the trip easier. You only have one thing you can do, which is to find the right companion. And that was about his life partner, uh, Chris Hegedus, who was sitting in the front seat, who drove around the world in a broken car with him. This is the simplest form of solidarity I believe in. But that moment when he said this on stage to me made me again realize that what we do is meaningful. There is meaning to doing this. I cannot know what exactly is that meaning because that would be me in Nirvana and I'm not there yet, but there must be meaning to that. The end of this festival we organized in Syria was again a question of meaning. So the last edition of the festival took place actually closed curtain, ended three days before, before the beginning of the Syrian revolution in 2011. So we closed curtain on March 11 and the revolution erupted in March 15. On that last edition, there were revolutions all around the region and we had to walk a very thin line. We even had, for the first time, the Minister of Culture start calling us every day on our cell phones to say, don't talk about revolutions. He never called us anyway before. We did it. We spoke about revolutions. And then gradually, revolution was faced by an army, and there were massacres everywhere in the country. And we discovered that for the first time, the authorities are encouraging us to organize the festival next year. That after all of that, after all the death, the authorities felt that having an international film festival that is independent, not run by the government, in 2012 would have been the best thing they can have. And that was when we decided to do what was obviously crazy at the time, we were still living in Syria, and publish a statement announcing that we will be holding back the festival in, in, in protest to human rights violations by the government. And instead of the festival, we organized what we call the reverse Docs Box, which is, uh, we called it the Global Day for Syria, and that's instead of bringing films from all around the world to screen inside Syria, we took Syrian films and we screened them in 38 countries around the world. Through partnerships, through the solidarity of a community and global community of different film and documentary film operators and festivals and organizations and friends, who took these films and organized screenings on their own without, certainly without any funding. And we had no funding. We only had the support and the friendship of various organizations everywhere. We did that for two years, 2012 and 2013. And then Docsbox transformed into a, a support organization based in Berlin. And I stopped working on that. 
And I decided that I don't want to help anybody do anything better anymore. And I want to go work only as a producer because I'm so tired of all of this public benefit kind of thing. And I was also a bit traumatized, I must say. So I had to uh, uh, really take a break. Then three years ago now, there was this vacancy in Amsterdam in my favorite big festival. And the festival ITFA was uh, uh, in need or calling for a new director. And I certainly did not assume that I would be fit for the job. I thought maybe in 20 more years, but then friends encouraged me and I applied. And now I am the artistic director of ITFA for two and a half years. The difference is remarkable. There's no doubt when I'm talking about in the field of documentary film, fest film festivals, this is the biggest in the world. So there is certainly no comparison to uh, any other festival in the field in terms of size, guarantee of financing, balance, experience of team, number of team members and number of audience. It is a massive operation we get 295,000 visits uh, every year in ITFA. We uh, do so much year round. So we do, uh, we have a fund that supports filmmakers with projects in the global south and in parts of Eastern Europe. We have an industry uh, uh, operation where we support filmmakers with projects, find the finances they need. So we help financiers find projects to work on. We have uh, an extensive year round uh, program of training filmmakers, young filmmakers from the world, from the global south and from the Netherlands. And then we have the festival, the program of films that plays 300 films every year in November, plus a, an extensive uh, 13 years old now, a new media program that does all kinds of um, documentary treatment of reality that is through different forms of uh, artistic expression. So from virtual reality to augmented reality, to audio walks, to artificial intelligence, etc. Now, many people come and ask me the question, what, what did you bring from that experience in Syria to this experience in Amsterdam? And I think it is... Uh, uh, I'm always disappointed when the question is about particulars, when somebody assumes that what I bring from that experience to this experience is a direct learning, because it is not. There is a huge difference between the two, but at the core, I think what I learn is searching for the meaning. What I learn is disrespect to, is to disrespect the setup is to disrespect the autopilot, is to disrespect how things seem to make sense and how things work every year in every place, in every organization of fe or festival without having to re-examine them. And the more successful the organization is, the less it feels compelled to re-examine the meaning of what it does. So. We try to do this in ITFA, absolutely. We've been trying to change and shift and re, re, redesign, reshape a lot of the elements of the festival over the past three years now. But then came Corona. Then came Corona and now, no matter what reality seems like in June, three months ago, we all know that the whole world was shocked by this question, online or physical. And the exercise for three months has been to try and see what is it that we can do online? Can we do it online? Should we do it online? What's the meaning of doing it online? And if there is one thing I could work on was then to say, who cares how we can translate what we used to do to an online operation? And why would we try to translate what we're doing. I think, I think uh, I'm sorry that Inge is uh, interrupting me very constructively. 
uh, it's in a way what happened here was the question why would what's the meaning of a festival and if we take it online what remains of the meaning and what changes of the meaning and a festival is made of three four five ten twenty different components or elements if we try to translate each one of them to an online parallel or an online way of doing it it will probably be possible with different levels of success or failure but if we translate every component of the festival to an online activity would that possibly keep a meaning Thus, we decided to throw away all of the 20 things that shape the festival and go back and ask, what's the meaning? And how can we do something online that responds, that actually respects the meaning of what we are trying to do here, rather than transliterate what we do in theater, in actual venues to an online space? Time changed. Corona started to open up a bit in Europe, and now we, we managed to reach a balanced proposal of how is it that we want to do a festival this year that you can read about and you can ask me about, of course. But it was at the heart a call for, again, forgetting about what we do, going back to the philosophical core of it, to the meaning, and trying to make sure that what we do is not about habits, is not about a, a status quo, is actually always examined and re-examined based on its surrounding and what it can mean. I think that I will defer to you, Mike, now, because I can start again uh, from a different angle, but I think that I finished this uh, uh, rant. Okay, well, thank you very, very much for that, Olva. That was a, a really good build up to where we are now. Um, so maybe just if you could, before we open it up for discussion with the participants here, talk a little bit about what you have come to conclude, because I think that would be interesting for people who have been putting on festivals in the past, who have been challenged now by COVID-19, and who are facing the same challenge that you did. What do they do now? So tell us a little bit about what you are planning to do. Well, basically, it was, <clears throat> I'll talk about one element, uh, the main element, which is the film program, so film screenings. Uh, this is politically a very, very uh, uh, difficult subject. When and politically, I mean in the politics of the film world and festivals world. Um, basically, what happened with the first uh, uh, row festivals that were hit by COVID-19 just a week before they were opening, for example, is that they had to go online fully uh, and they used a systems that are very similar to what uh, to Netflix, for example, or Amazon or so on. So they made films available online for audiences to buy a ticket that allows them to watch the film whenever they want over the coming few days. And then they pre-recorded Q&A sessions with the artists and they kept them as bonus material. When you buy a ticket, you can watch the film, but you can also watch this Q&A, etc. And this uh, did meet some good uh, echoes in some examples. And uh, basically it was successful, in my opinion, also be in grace of solidarity because many people in the audience and in the art world wanted to stand by the side of those of us who had to survive such a moment. However, this also created problems. First, it was proving to be very much uh, uh, making making artists unhappy, basically, because when you work on a film for years and you want that moment of the premiere where you show this film to an audience and you smell and hear the audience laughing and, and 
uh, bored or crying or hating you or liking this moment or not. And then you get this direct touch with the audience. And this was, of course, so diluted because you couldn't even know if people are watching now or not. But it was spread over time and it was very open. And then you can only get the final numbers from the festival telling you this and this and that much many people watch your film. So this was a clear problem for filmmakers, for artists. The other problem was industrial, was business related. Because many of these artists have hopes that some online platform such as Netflix or Amazon or more artistic ones like Mubi, etc., would possibly buy their film after it's premiered in a good festival like this or that. And then <clears throat> when the festivals went online in this way, those online platforms decided that this works against their benefit. So they stopped taking films that were put online this way by festivals. And suddenly festivals realized, we realized that we were harming the filmmakers because we were without realizing this for those who did this, we were competing suddenly with these mega corporations, which is absolutely not our field and not our business. Uh, so what we are doing, which we announced last week, and uh, I'm very glad to hear that already a few festivals are following suit now uh, around the world and developing similar ideas, is that we, will uh, work in a very flexible manner, every film. So let's say usually a film would get five screenings in cinema, in the festival, in a normal uh, edition of our festival. Now we will start with a theatrical screening in a cinema, no matter how many people can sit there. Because worst case scenario, it will be a screening with only 30 people in the cinema. But there are better scenarios that could happen too. This is not feasible, this is economically a disaster, but it has all the symbolic value that we should protect from my viewpoint. So a film will get its first screening always in a cinema, no matter whether it is 300 people, 3000 people, or only 30 people. The more this becomes doable, so if it's not 30, if it's 100 persons, we will do then three screenings in cinema. If we do one screening in cinema, it will be followed by three screenings of the film online. If we do three screenings in cinema, it will be followed by only one screening online. And screenings online will not be made on demand, they will be live streamed. So you would have to buy a ticket for a discounted rate and be online ready to watch the film at the hour of the screening. The concept here that we're calling togetherness, this togetherness here is about having the filmmaker or, or the program, the curators, introduce the film live to people in their homes, followed by the actual film running live stream. So it's, it's, you don't watch half of it and continue next day. You're gonna stay watching and followed after the film ends by a live streamed Q and A with the filmmaker. So it is the closest to the setup in a cinema and it is about people each at home being together for at one moment. So the symbolism here, which is technically very difficult, but we're also trying, the symbolism here is to upload the filmmaker from our living rooms. So filmmakers will have this moment where they know this is the audience, they are now starting the film now they got to a moment where my character is said this or that. Now the film is going to end and the filmmakers will get this chance of being very anxious before the ending. And then they will get the chance to see or at least to hear a question or two from the audience. Now, this can happen a few times according to how much we can actually do cinema screenings, usual screenings. So it will be less in theater, more online, or vice versa, according to the health situation. Now, this is the concept that we're running with now. Um, whereas a lot of the social experience of the festival is going to be 
online. So the business side, pitching projects, talking to financiers, etc., having meetings, a lot of this will be online this year. We will see how that goes. People are more and more used to it. We are all less annoyed by it, very tired of it, but at least getting used to it more. On the other hand, we have the opposite problem now or risk, which is the fact that if we do not prepare enough activity in place physically in Amsterdam during the festival dates, there might be many who can come and would like to come and might actually come only to discover that if they come to Amsterdam to the festival, they probably have to stay in their hotel room on the laptop to be online connected to our online activities. So this is another angle here that we're trying to work on. And what we're doing here is that we're developing a lot of the talk, the panels, the think tanks, the discussions, the roundtables, in a way uh, that we're actually using actual theaters as uh, live streaming studios. So the live stream will be online, but it will take place from an actual theater. So if people can sit in the chairs and in, in the seats of this theater, then that would be great. They would be there. They would be taking part in person, but also at the same time live streamed. Or it will be just an empty theater. And then let's consider that just a scenographic uh, choice. So in a way, uh, that's what we're working on. Of course, um, ITFA has the budget to do this. The Netherlands have the subsidies to support ITFA when income fails this year. Not all countries have this, but the question, the challenge of searching for the creative exit, the creative solution, believe me, money or no money is a big deal, but it is also one other factor in the creative process of finding the solution. So at this exercise, gladly, my creative challenge was not including a big question mark over money. Only recently, because the Dutch government supported a cultural organization exceptionally for COVID-19 only one month ago. But uh, in this example, yes, we did not have to consider the finances too much, but we had to consider too many other factors. So in other cases, you will have less consideration on another side, more on the money side, but your own creative process, finding a way, finding your own proposal, how to do it, how does it keep a meaning, is certainly not a question of money. Will, will the audience watching at home, will they be able to ask questions of the director? And what is the technical means that you're going to use to do that? It, it, it is, we have seen different technical uh, solutions for this. Um, uh, the, the aim is yes, we will not settle for, it has to be more, even more than in cinema. When we have long talks with filmmakers in the cinema, not the usual quick Q&A, that's always interactive. But when we have a more serious interview on stage with a filmmaker after the screening, we frequently or uh, usually we don't take questions from the audience because there's no time and we needed to have its own structure as an interview. Uh, but when we're taking even this kind of interviews online, we have to take questions from the audience because if you are sitting in the cinema and everybody's in on stage in front of you uh, and you don't ask a question it is still instant you still have this direct theatrical experience that you are here and now when you go online you disconnect with this so it becomes very important to create the sense of instant uh, 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 experience or connection through means of asking questions. Now, technology here is something that we had to work together with other festivals. So we brought in a group of five festivals, in this case, Dutch festivals, to work together, co-invest in a new solution, technical solution. So this is also a, a, a moment of solidarity where none of these festivals could finance the technical solution necessary on its own. So we had to come together brainstorm together and invest some money, all of us, 
to do it. Uh, we're calling it the container, and this is in a way what we're doing is that we are creating a, an interface or a dashboard for the audience and the professionals uh, attending the festival to have a seamless experience because, you know, it is basically the, the most simple uh, example, but there are, of course, very complicated examples in the activity of a festival. Uh, the simple example is introduction and then film screening and then Q&A. So it's very uh, uh, normal that the introduction will be coming uh, via Zoom or Blue Jeans or uh, Jitsi or something. And then the film will be coming from a particular uh, protected, copyright protected uh, video playing uh, interface. And then the Q&A will be again back to something like Zoom, where people can also put questions in the chat box and the moderator can be there and somebody behind the scene is picking the questions from the chat box and passing them uh, to the moderator, etc. So what we're creating together with four other festivals is a technical interface, a, a solution so that this experience, these different tools are all behind the scene from the viewpoint of the audience. So you just follow this interface and the interface will be switching from one tool to the other for you so that you don't have to go to a new link and you will not, will not need to tell you, now please go to this link to watch the film and when you finish, come back to Zoom and you can have a Q&A. This will all be uh, hidden behind this new dashboard interface. So, but, but again, this is, this was impossible if we did not work on it together with others. So in a way, it's a need that has led to solidarity and innovation and possibly a new commercial product that you'll be able to sell to other festivals or other entities that might want to use a similar kind of thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid there will always be uh, uh, company partners working on the development of this and they will be the ones selling <laughs> it. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> You mentioned that um, there are about 15 to 20 elements of a festival that you would need to consider when, you know, translating something online. And then you mentioned two particular things that helped to shape your current um, definition of the festival, which was how the filmmakers would feel about their work kind of being simply shown and then the, um, the challenge of the industry not taking films that already had an online presence. You also said that, you know, you needed to look at the essential question why you were doing the festival. I'm not sure that I picked up the answer to that. Um, could you maybe tell us why you're doing the festival and what the essence of what it is that you're doing? I think it is, um... It is part of who I am, Mike, that I very, very uh, persistently resist stating, <laughs> answering such a question. Uh, but in a way, it is about experiencing art together. It is not about selling tickets. It is not about reaching the widest audience per se. So I work for a festival that managed no favor to me, no, not, not in uh, uh, my work, the work of my predecessor and all of the team over 33 years now, a festival that actually had more audience every year since it's establishing until today. So the line, the, 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 the diagram of ITVA is really fun to see. It's just so consistent. One year it was low because the weather was exceptionally good in November. Nobody went to the cinema. Another year was very low because it took place a few days after Batacalan in Paris. So nobody wanted to go to the cinema. Other than these two years, it was always more, more people interested in watching films than the year before. Now, there is a moment where we have to say, okay, but that's not the purpose. This is not why we do it. Because we want audience, we want many people, but it is not greed we're talking about here. We're not here to keep proving that we got more and more and more and more until we die happy uh, with 
more, you know? So uh, it, there is a limit to this aim. And the question becomes, how do we protect a meaningful experience for the audience and the filmmaker? And this comes from this sense of togetherness. That's the difference between being able to watch a film and actually joining a festival experience. So to, to me, and uh, this was a very problematic thing that I spoke about in the past three months, frequently in the field of film festivals, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the democratization of access to film that is coming from going online. And to me, I had a very big question against this. I basically think that this is a concept that comes only from the savior uh, privileged position, uh, because I don't think I grew up as someone who makes films accessible to people. I was at the very end of this, managing somehow to get a VHS of a great film uh, uh, by magic, actually. So when we put films online, in my viewpoint, we make them available for more people to watch them. But this is a consumeristic experience of actually watching the film. The experience of a festival, what I wish, what I wish for people who do not have access to watching films is not that they watch the film, is not that they get the chance to see the film. I don't wish them a big box of DVDs, for example, or links to watch films. I wish them an actual cinema in their neighborhood. I wish them an actual collective experience, a festival, something that they can do together, something that they can learn together. And here is the question of the meaning to me. So in a way, this sense of democratization seems like democratization from one angle. From the other angle, it seems like consumerism. So what do you do with a film? You watch it. You watch the hell of it and you watch 20 films, but then not one of them in a cinema with others, not one of them as part of a collective societal or, or human experience that brings people together. And this becomes even bigger when we look at North versus South. When we look at the question of what do we do for all of these good people in the South that do not have the chance, you know, to get a good opportunity to watch films together. Well, then, yes, it is better that they watch the films alone on a link on online than not watching the films. But this is not what we do in a festival to me. This is the job of somebody else. I have all appreciation to it. It's just not my business. <laughs> it's an interesting answer. Um, I work in the field of theater and it's an answer that is probably, I would have thought much more appropriate to the realm of theater than it is to film, precisely because of you know the direct relationship between live performers on the stage on the one hand and a live audience. And there's something that happens that is kind of magical that you know, makes theater theater, as opposed to a film experience, which one might watch collectively with others, but it's a film that, you know, it's on screen. There isn't any direct interaction between the, <laughs> so it's an industry answer. Mike, I switched, I studied theater. I studied, <laughs> and I came originally from a theater uh, uh, right. approach. And to me, that is the point. It is back to uh, August Ball. Yeah, you know, what we're talking about here is uh, when when I look from the from the seat, from uh, to, to to the screen or to the stage, I see that theater is fresh every day, changing. And the film is actually the same film every time. It's, oh. it, it gets I get this sense that it is static. It's finished, accomplished. But if I look from the screen to the audience. The audience, this is the first time these people sit together, by the way, and it's probably the only time the same group is going to be sitting together. Yeah. The combination of this identity of this audience is new every time. And the actual context, historical, social, political, 
to the experience of this group of people coming into the cinema, sitting together, watching a film, changes, the film changes, the meaning of the film changes, every connotation in it changes. When you watch a film in, uh, I'm, I'm stuck with the, our Brazilian friends because I was making coffee while they were speaking. Uh, if you watch the same film under uh, Lula de Silva and then watch the same film three years later under Bolsonaro, it's a different film. It's an absolute different film. The meaning of watching it is different. And the way it moves you is different. The way you see it is different. So in this sense, it is a total reappropriation that every new audience does. And, and we don't do this alone. We don't do this alone. I, I, uh, I still watch films alone for, for a living. I watch at least 700 films per year now. Uh. When I do that, it's it's a marathon. It's that that's the big part of my job. And sure. of course, I have to watch films on a link online at home. But of course, if I don't fix a good chair and a big screen, <laughs> and listen to audio, I will die because. It's <laughs> but then, then it becomes all about relativity. Then I watch film after film, and I get depressed at the reality of the world and at the reality, terrible reality of bad films and bad filmmaking. And then one film comes and wakes me up and makes me excited again. And I have energy to watch 20 bad films after that again. And, but that's curation, isn't it? You have to watch so much. You have to filter and create a thread in your own approach to what is it that we do? Uh, what's the meaning of creating this lineup of films together or artworks or theater pieces or musical pieces i count everything because i don't yet know what each one of you do guys what kind of work you do so i'm just just in case counting theater music you know hoping it hits one of you looking who will smile when i say theater who will smile when i say music yeah not everybody's smiling. I don't know what you do, but that's <laughs> where I start asking you questions. People are smiling while they kind of, um, you know, have put their videos off while they are eating. But I suppose maybe the, the, the one difference between film and theater still in terms of what you're saying is that the live experience of an audience could possibly change the theater form could change the theatre production. There could be additions that are improvised on the day, depending on how the audience is responding, which is kind of different to, to the film. But that's a, that's, that's a by the way chat. There's a question here, um, Orwa, from um, Angela, from Malta. Angela? Hi, Angela. Hi. Hi, hello, um, Orwa. Um, it was a pleasure listening to you. So we are in a bit of a situation here locally. Um, we have we had uh, one festival, of uh, one uh, film festival. I uh, I was involved. Um, I I volunteered in it to present. I followed, uh, I followed with the experience. Yeah. And I uh, and currently we film film uh, we film files and everyone involved um, is petitioning and lobbying to get it back on its feet. And I was wondering because we're doing. Everyone, every one of us is uh, filming a, co a comment. And uh, as you were speaking, I was wondering, why does my country need a film festival? Obviously, with, with every, every, every sentence you were saying, I got the answer, but I was wondering um, what I would be saying, <laughs> how effective, because I've seen what the other practitioners were saying, and then it's all my experience of what I've taken but I, I, I feel that to move um, to move an, an, an agency or a government entity to give you back the 30 percent that you need, you need a statement that that hits home. And we're a democratic country. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My sentiment exactly with that shake, but anyway, so I I was I was very sorry. My children are running around, and so, <laughs> so I was wondering. But you inspired me a lot. I just wanted to say that your your comments were very inspirational, and I think I will have something cool to say, <laughs> and hope to lobby 
for our need to have a film festival, to have uh, film I'm practitioners come. If, I'm very happy if you feel this way. And I just want to say one thing. There is one scenario of doing the festival that requires this 30% from this ailing uh, found, uh, uh, institution. Is there no other scenario of doing something that is still meaningful, that is smaller, that is smarter, that doesn't necessarily need this 30%? Because it's As you are talking, I was thinking, yes, we should, I, I will propose it to the programmers. They're my friends and uh, we discuss things together to make it more educational. And I will take your suggestions actually. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you and good luck. <laughs> we need it. <laughs> There's a question from Tom Creed from Ireland. Thanks for the uh, presentation. It's really uh, inspiring to hear. Um, I know it's um, you haven't done the the COVID edition of the festival yet, so the, the the things you discover you haven't discovered them yet. But are there things that you uh, have been forced to do as a result of the pandemic that you might you think that you might continue with afterwards? Are there um, are there are there positive changes that might have come out of this? You know how they talk about sorry sorry Orwa, and while you while you're reflecting on that, the other part of that question is. Are there things that you are doing now because of COVID-19, which could actually be unnecessary in November because conditions might have changed quite substantially then? Absolutely. Also, <laughs> uh, just to put it in a, 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 indirectly, because of course I will not bore you with all the details. This is a very long list of examples. Uh, I'd never forget, uh, I think it was Akira Kurosawa in his uh, memoirs that he described what the emperor of Japan did during the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki attack, that he actually ordered his army, his uh, um, imperial guards to kill all the communists, because it was very good that they killed them during this big uh, uh, moment of death, and nobody would notice that they murdered them. So I think there's something similar also. It is a good moment to get rid of what you think would not be so good. When you get a chance to revise all of what you're doing, to go back to basics, to think about the meaning and to say, what is it that is worth doing in a year so special like this? You are not expected to come back next year to exactly what was in 2019. So this is a big important, uh, very important point to me. It is this year with all of the terrible moment that we're, the terrible experience in it is also an unprecedented opportunity to revise, reimagine, drop down things, take up new approaches, revise the ethos, revise the design. It is just the right moment to do that. Now, I think that there is something positive in being able to uh, uh, integrate internet into our processes so much more than before. I can tell you that even on the smallest level of an example, not in all the cinemas in Amsterdam, which is a very well uh, serviced city and really very advanced and rich, etc. Not all the theaters had the possibility of using high-speed internet. If the filmmaker is not there, we could not have a Skype with the filmmaker in every cinema. There were only a few cinemas that we could do that. So now this is becoming the standard. Every last small cinema will have the possibility of live streaming from now on. Uh, so this is one simple thing. Now, will I keep showing films online, I don't know. I need time like many others. I think we need to do it this year and see what is the benefit. If I discover, for example, that it is taking films and creating an audience that is just not taken out from the audience I would like to see in the cinema. So if this is going to elderly people, if this is going to people in the smaller villages with no cinema nearby, then I would be uh, trying to keep that up or to, to, to not to drop that uh, entirely in the future. But if it is only an extra option for our consumeristic need to choose whether we want this here or there and which cheese do we want, 
I don't feel compelled. The factor of coming together is no less important or valuable in my view than actually getting the uh, uh, the film or getting the uh, uh, result of whatever it is that I want. So, uh, but again, this is a question that changes with the meaning of every different festival. So in the case of ITFA, we're talking uh, about a festival that has big audience plus big professional business side. So uh, if we're talking about a different setup, you can have a totally different philosophy and a different angle, and this will bring about different outcome, different conclusions. Now, will we do things this year? I don't, I think that first thing is that this experience of creating this, what I told you about this dashboard, this interface for a seamless online experience. Well, if we don't have a new virus in two or three years, then I don't know why we're investing all of this money into this. But at the same time, it is a very important learning curve. So if things go back to normal, then we will be using this rarely. It will not remain to be as important as we think it is now when we are doing it, making it, creating it. But still, we're learning from this. I don't see this as a waste, even if we cannot use it as much as we want in two years' time, because we're still experimenting and we will come up with different findings. Um, what else? I mean, it's there's so much that we don't know yet, um, but I think that the whole experience of festival watching films or artworks online, I find to be questionable, but I am very much ready to see somebody slap me on the face and tell me only because you are narrow-minded or to show me that from a different viewpoint, it makes sense. With a different rationale, it makes sense. Um, again, I don't think that consumerism is just evil. Uh, I think it's just not mine. Maybe somebody else can do something good with it. I didn't meet them yet, but I still keep the space for that doubt. Um, maybe someone can do something online that is not consumeristic. And then I will be just jealous and happy to discover. Um, so it is it is really try and error. It is really learn by doing. It is really, otherwise it's very boring. Otherwise this business of doing festivals is the most boring business in the world. Why do we want to keep doing the same thing every year and just enjoy that the others, the artists, the makers are the ones making new stuff, but we are actually doing the same job vis-a-vis -vis their work. Uh, so basically a festival can actually be an artwork in itself if we allow it to, if we respect it enough, give it this continuous doubt and art is I think measured by doubt rather than by knowing. So the, the more we know how to do it, the more dead we are, the more we doubt our conclusions, the more we are alive and youthful. Uh, that, that's basically the whole point here. Great, well, thank you very much. Maybe, maybe, well, Adele, Adele from Egypt has, has a question. Or a comment. Hello? Hello, Arwa. Uh, we met uh, we met in uh, Istanbul uh, 2011, I think, with the British Council. And uh, it's very interesting to see you again. Uh, what is important is that what you said the, the last thing uh, it's about the festival itself. It's a uh, artwork. Like for me, it's uh, I'm do doing a theater festival. I call it forum for, uh, and it is for political theater. So I uh, each time I think when I do the festival, it's 
I have a new dramaturgy for new dramaturgy for the festival and always the doubt and the fear of failing and everything. But it's very important also because I am in the question now in the question of uh, about the political statement somehow because uh, to 2021 we, I will organize a festival for uh, uh, and it will be 10 years after the revolution. Uh, and it's a political theater festival in Egypt now. <laughs> uh, it's independent for sure. So I'm, I'm asking myself this question all the time. How, like, I, I have somehow the same conventions that you have about uh, art or theater or cinema. It, sh it should not change uh, the next day or make voters to change the... Uh, in the next election, it's a process and it's a very important and deep and profound. But also, it's. But also, I feel that we should, we we should have somehow uh, choose uh, like not choose. We should use the momentum somehow. And I don't know. Like also, I have many questions related to censorship. Related, it's not just me. It's not the subjective motive that I would like to do festival and somehow try to gather performances, talk about Arab uh, Egyptian revolution, and intersect with the idea. So it's not my call at the end. I know there is many questions and doubts. We it will be stopped or uh, <laughs> because and also in my festival I uh, very much to uh, to put anything to the table of censorship uh, and we succeed to do six edition till now until the COVID-19 we stopped because uh, it was a march but it was very uh, inspiring what you said and just I won't say hi it was nice to see you also it was nice to see you in and Edfa, because this is very important thing when you as a creator, uh, curator now uh, break a taboo for me also, because also it's always white uh, male curators uh, talking about us and uh, somehow drive our narratives, even when they are curate our art. But uh, yes, it's uh, very pleasant to see you and to hear you. Yeah, I think Thank it is a radical act from the team and the board of ITFA to hire me. Yes, it was a radical action and I, I salute them for that, absolutely. But I just want to tell you one thing, Adil, and uh, nobody can really help further than just standing in solidarity and asking you, how can we help you? But uh, the other side of this is to say, a festival is not worth dying for. You will find a way to do it without dying for it. You will find a way to do it the best possible way. And just to tell you one thing to, to all of you, because this applies also to being in front of a dictator, in or in front of a massive uh, uh, corporation sponsor, it's the same. The question of signing the, the Faustus, uh, uh, Dr. Faust's, you know, uh, accord happens only when you doubt yourself. So when you know who you are, you don't need people to tell you you did well. You have a clear position here and you will be criticized by peers and friends and every one of you around the world is going to have difficult voices around them whether positively interestingly critical or very aggressively uh, 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 malicious even and it will always happen and it will always break your morale but the point of doing a festival in such a context is to think what is it that I can do while still staying alive and keeping the festival alive? And am I ashamed of it or is it still okay? So it will not be all that you want 
but will it be worth doing or it, still, or is it passing that line? So, Orwa, I'd like to maybe pick up on the question that Adele raised, as well as something else that you were talking about earlier. And um, I don't know how to say this other than to maybe preface it by saying that you seem like a really nice person. So please see it. The question I'm going to ask coming from a degree of, of real respect for, for you and what you're doing. I just wondered about your comment earlier that you know work that is overtly political kind of dies very soon within six months because of the aesthetics of it not being particularly good because of the overt kind of statements. I was just wondering about the extent to which um, that might not be um, a position of luxury that within contexts of dictatorship and the like that perhaps you know, the need for art that is about change, that is about effecting fundamental transformation of that society, um, it's necessary within that moment. And that the notion of art in the way that you described it earlier might be a notion of art that is for people who have relative privilege, who live in conditions of luxury. So I just wondered, you know, your description of your early life as being one um, with juxtaposing radicalism with pragmatism, I wondered how you felt today you were expressing your radicalism. This is a very difficult question because I think it's so much more subversive and imp 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 implicit than, than that. Uh, on one hand, just to return to the point of political, I believe that art is political as much as a festival is a political action. I just do not believe, or I am categorically against the use of art as a tool for political work. So we can see now how much there is around the world, artists, but also mostly financiers and government approaches that are positioning art as a tool for development, a tool for uh, progress, a tool to promote, a tool to, what's the word, combat Donald Trump, a tool to, uh, you know, like, and then we get the funding for that. And then we get a new generation or a new wave of artists and artworks that actually are what I call counter propaganda, because in a way I am against propaganda, even when it is promoting what I believe in. So uh, uh, the, the, the notion of propaganda is the problem with political work here in art or utilitarianism in approaching art. Uh, so it is political. I've never done anything that is not political to the core, uh, but I just try to avoid the pragmatic approach that we make this film or this piece or any uh, form of art so that we change somebody's mind or explain something to them and show them they are wrong or consolidate the voters of one uh, uh, political opinion. No, this is about political being the, the, the core of human nature of what, who we are. We are political, we need to, we are being deprived of our politicalness by, by consumerism, by neoliberalism, by, we are not, we, we want it back. I don't want to add it to people. I want to take away the blockage. <laughs> so in, in a way it is political in a much deeper sense than making a film that will tell me how good this or that person is or how bad the other one is, or films or projects or artworks that come with this angle that says something like the truth. You, you know, all of this work on the truth, I think is very problematic, is very anti-philosophical in a way, just keeping always on, it is a very big deal in documentary film because it is about reality. And then everybody starts mixing reality with the truth and the truth becomes this very, 
a, a binary religious concept, you know, uh, and take it from there. So where is my radicalism here? It is just, honestly, I think it is about going back to the meaning. It is, I do not see this as a conformist or a, um, I think this is what costs so much to do. And it is an easy, uh, catchy phrase to say, but in practice, it operates totally against the institution, totally against the, the way things operate in this world today. So yes, we, uh, yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, did you see Minor Shot Down by Rihard Desai? Yeah, I think of course I did. It's a yeah. Big film. Yeah, and what did you think of it? What did you think it was more propaganda than art? Always, always, deeply, profoundly. And that is something that I deeply respect about, for example, Rihard Desai. This is one South African filmmaker that Mike is mentioning, who is a friend and who is a, a very, very experienced filmmaker, who is deeply direct action political. So he makes documentary films that really tackle direct political uh, unrest, direct political questions, and they are in many ways mobilizing and lobbying. So this is one genre of a vast offer of documentary film. This one genre is very questionable. Sometimes it passes the test. It is direct hands-on, but it still does have an author's voice, a voice of an artist behind it. Most of the time, when you make work like this, the artist feels that their own voice is not worthy, that their job is to give voice to everyone else. You know, that they, and this makes it fall off from the point of the question of art. And this is why I'm very uh, friendly, in a friendly manner, very harsh on Riyadh, for example, or filmmakers like that, because it is always a question to me, why would you have to make this film? And can I replace you as an artist? Because if you are making a film about the Rhodes statue in Cape Town, for example, then I can import a filmmaker coming from any other country to come and make a film about this. Mike just disappeared into the background. He turned into, <laughs> he turned into black. Becoming a ghost. I was, I was just reminded by someone that the sun is kind of shining in a way here that I'm completely disappearing. <laughs> so I just want to go and shut the shutters. Sorry. All right. no, so, so there's a question here. I cannot from, take out, I cannot deprive a filmmaker like Rihad Desai or a filmmaker like Michael Moore of his right or her right to be considered a real filmmaker. I'm just questioning the actual um, effectivity of this even, even politically. I think these are films, for example, that consolidate the same opinion, films that preach to the choir. I think that you cannot preach uh, uh, this viewpoint to, the, to people who do not already agree with you unless you really step back further and make something that is much slower, more profound. There's a question from Angela from Peru for you, Orwa. Hi, Orwa. Hi, Hi Orwa. Uh, it was very inspiring what you said. I was wondering uh, if IDF has a program to create audiences to educate people in order to watch documentary or films in, in, in the whole. Uh, and in order to spread the meaning of watching films, because like here we we offer, you know, this this kind of contents to audiences, but uh, they are not used to go to, to, to watch this kind of stuff. It, it is very special in Peru, to be honest, Angela, um, it, it, because in, in most countries around your region, there are uh, documentary film festivals that are operating well and uh, that we work with, that we collaborate with, that at some port moments, ITFA had uh, funding for festivals. Mm -hmm. So also ITFA used to finance festivals in uh, different countries in the regions, in, in, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in, in, you know, so, but I don't remember a festival in Peru uh, that we worked with that, or that I heard of that works in documentary film. 
So I am not really uh, in, in the full picture of what's what's up in Peru about wh why there isn't. Uh, yeah. But it is also uh, it needs to start from an initiative, local initiative, to me. So, uh, yeah, in in a in a basic sense, when we, for example, this is I think a key point in having a southerner uh, at the helm of such a festival is that. I, I block any project to support or finance or sponsor or uh, create uh, local chapters of what we do in Amsterdam. All that I can believe in is that somebody in a country initiates their own project, their own festival, and then we will be very happy and we will work our best to be supportive of them, to offer them our resources, network, uh, uh, knowledge, access to films, etc., but never actually uh, parachute in, you know, and never go to uh, to develop a connection between Edfa, Amsterdam, and the Peruvian audience. Oh God, here I am. So I will knock yeah, your door. We don't. I, I think it would be a disaster if we develop a relationship with the Peruvian. Why, you know? That's how my country was destroyed. It was not about art, it was more political. But yes, everybody, every Western power and Eastern power started wanting to talk directly to the people. You know, so they removed the agency of politicians, they removed the agency of intellectuals. And I think it's necessary to always have this local angle. So whenever somebody starts something in Peru, you will see it for first there. I promise we have a very, very uh, close relationship with the whole region. Uh, Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Otwa, the interesting thing is that Angela actually works for the Hay Festival in Peru. So it's a basically a, a, for the Hay Festival, the literary the festival. Hay, which yes, is, of course. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's basically like a franchise in a way of the Hay Festival in the UK. So I suppose it might also be from that angle that you might have been asking the question. Yeah, I think in the UK, I think in the UK, there's a great mastership of creating a cultural uh, uh, franchise. So, uh, and I am very critical of that. I, I, well, I it, it never really like that. It, it really doesn't work as a franchise, you know, because each, each branch of Hay Festival has its own administration, local administration, and we, we fight for, you know, it, to include... Uh, local and national contents into the, the whole strategy. Super, so, yeah. absolutely Great. super. I'm just talking about the foundation of this concept yeah. uh, of taking the brand name globally. Yeah, which is like, it sounds like a McDonald's, you know, it's so, so, so <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we there's, don't want <laughs> there's, there's a final question from Mira. Um, it's 4.03, so we need to end soon, but Mira from India. Hey, Mira. Yeah. So it's yeah. just a comment, Orva, it was a great talk. I really enjoyed and coming from a country uh, where watching cinema is an experience, I can really understand what you said, but I, I'm talking about commercial cinema. The state I come from, all the heads of states are uh, uh, either a film actor or a film screenwriter and we have our own superstars and if a movie releases it's like a festival and i think i was eight or nine there was an american ambassador who wrote about a opening of a rajnikant movie who is the superstar of tamil yeah. cinema and he said it's like a festival until then i thought every movie release is like that. You throw paper, you whistle, you pour milk on the cutouts. And that's the first time I realized that, no, it's only a phenomenon um, specific to Tamil Nadu. That was the time there was no internet and we only rely on newspaper. And I, and the, the thing about experience, uh, it really um, uh, connected me to the way we uh, watch films in India. Thank you for that. I just want to make to say, a like comment, but yeah. You're most welcome, Mira, and it's a pleasure to meet you and to hear you, but you, you please do take a look at the reality of documentary filmmaking in India now. Yes, because we, have, we, we have showcased many documentary films as part of our small events, especially by Anand Patwardhan and uh, yeah, so what's that. Happening, yeah, what's happening yeah. now with Anand Patwardhan and others in India is 
terrible, criminal. It's yes. absolutely unacceptable, but they are still trying to find ways. I receive an, uh, every week a new WhatsApp uh, from an aunt showing me what films they are showing for free to India on WhatsApp. So it's even a festival on WhatsApp now to, to re reflect yeah. what's happening. Because in the of the right wing government and the censorship being very stringent, it's, it's, it's just not documentary films. It's also commercial films. They can kind of, anything can be protested and stopped. So if a, if an organization decides they don't want a film to go off because they felt the content is bad and it just it's it's becoming very sensitive. But I know it, I I've been watching. But I thought on a lighter note, I will add from a country where cinema is big. I just wanted to add about the experience part of it. Thank you so much, and it was one of the wonderful talk I've ever had. Okay, um, Mira, since we've had a question from Bollywood, I'm going to have to allow a question from Nollywood. Joshua has a question from Nigeria. <laughs> Please. And that's the final um, hi. Um, oh, uh, my name is Joshua. Um, okay. Um, thank you for um, everything inspiring that you've talked about. Um, so, uh, straight to my question, Nigeria Documentary Film Festival called IREP, the IREP International Documentary Film Festival. However, I'm not hearing you, Joshua. Um, there's been this. Maybe put your question in the chat. We don't hear you. Um, uh, Joshua, we're not able to hear you. I'm just wondering. Um, Discussion. You, you do have your video off, so it's no. not that. That's going on about. Okay, can we maybe um, just mute Joshua? I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Um, and maybe Joshua, if you can just call, um, yeah, send your message through on the chat and we'll ask Aura to respond to it. But Aura, maybe just to end off by saying a huge thank you for spending 90 minutes with us, sharing your wisdom. There are lots of one-liners coming out of your presentation, which I think we're going to go away with. I mean, I've written down just four here. The more successful an event, the less inclined we are to reflect critically on it. And I think that that's something that I think we all need to go away with. Art is measured by doubt rather than by knowing. A festival is not worth dying for. And probably the baseline corporations and dictators, they're exactly the same. So <laughs> on that note, just on behalf of all of us, thank you very, very much for being here. And maybe you can join the social club that is happening after this. I'm not sure some people would like to continue to chat to you. But thanks again. Really thank you very it. much. And I am I'm very sorry to, to Joshua. Uh, and I promise, I, if if I can answer my email later, I would gladly do that. I'm sorry that I had to run to a next meeting, but I will not join you uh, for the oh. social event. But uh, it was a pleasure, a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Orwa, for uh, joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, I need to wrap up for the, the the live stream. But if you have to run, you can go. I just want to say huge thanks because. Uh, the first time we met, we started talking and we did not stop. It feels like it was an immediate friendship. And that's also how, how I've experienced this keynote. It's like you're a wonderful person, I think. And you touched upon the importance of live engagement, which is why the social time after this is so important for us to do that within this space with our participants. Um, so I have one final question for you. Did you find the meaning of a festival together with us? It's a uh, joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course I, I did through the questions. It is um, through somebody's nod at one sentence, through, yeah, uh, it's, it only always comes, the meaning comes from the, the echo, the, the, the response, and uh, yes, I absolutely did. 
And again, it is a continuous examination. It's, I found it now, it might not be valid in five minutes. We will have to keep the questioning. Great. I think that <laughs> if even for five minutes, we know the meaning of what we are doing, that's, that's wonderful. So uh, people who are joining on the live stream, we are back here tomorrow with two public panels uh, with speakers from the UK, Kate uh, Craddock of GIFT, Sefer from Iran, uh, who was in this session as well, Rashmi from ArtX Company, uh, Vincent de Repontigny from OFTA in Montreal, and Jeff Kahn, Artistic Director of the Performance Space in Sydney, to talk about um, online festivals and how to do that. And we have a keynote, a global keynote again, um, from Ana Carla Fonseca Reis, who will talk about, from Brazil, who will talk about the role of uh, creative industries. So thank you for joining us. We see you tomorrow. And thanks to the audience. I've seen many ch small children following as well. <laughs> <laughs>